all the way. From Dallas, Texas, America's number one show band, Texas the Band. Emma, do you know who that is? Yeah. You're going to do an impression of her? Yeah. All right. Emma Taylor. <laughs> America has decided the winner of America's Got Talent. The winner of the title Best New Act in America. And the winner of one million dollars is... But Candyman is here. What kind of candy do you want? Sweet chocolate? Chocolate malted candy? Gumdrops? Anything you want, you come to the right man, because I'm the Candyman. Who can take a sunrise? Sprinkle it with you. Gather it in chocolate and a miracle or two. The Candyman. Candyman. Oh, the candy man can. The candy man can. The candy man can, cause he mixes it with love and makes the world taste good. Hello and welcome to Landon Live. <laughs> My name is Landon Harvey and today we have singer, celebrity impressionist, and ventriloquist Terry Fader. Terry, how are you doing today? Man, I'm doing really good. Good talking to you, Landon. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. So let's just get right into it. How did you get into ventriloquism? Um, I was uh, 10 years old and I had... I had seen ventriloquists, you know, come to my church and stuff, and they were absolutely terrible. And I knew they were terrible, even at like four and five years old. I remember one time this uh, right. this, this ventriloquist, and here I'm like, like I think I was four, and this ventriloquist had this puppet in church, and they were talking about Jesus and his tarattles. And I'm thinking, what is a tarattle? And and it wasn't until I was old enough to understand and I started doing ventriloquism that he couldn't say parable, <laughs> parable. <laughs> and so, so I'm like, okay. I'm, so even as a kid, I was like, oh. but but it but it always fascinated me. It was interesting. And you know, when I would see people like Edgar Bergen, of course, Jimmy Nelson, uh, Paul Winchell, Sherry Lewis, uh, it was always fascinating as a kid. And then of course, I got into the Muppets uh, <clears throat> once I. I started watching Sesame Street and The Muppet Show. But as 10 years old, I accidentally found a book on how to be a ventriloquist, just kind of came across it in um, in my school library. And really, the reason I decided to do it was because there was a lot of kids uh, that were doing things in the school talent shows. And I was I, every year, I tried out for the talent show, I get in the talent show, and I would sing, and I did magic one time. I tried to do hypnosis one year. I mean, this is a, as a kid, and I thought, yeah. you know, there's, not a, there's nobody doing ventriloquism in the talent shows, so mm -hmm. I'll try this. And so I just got the book, and I found out um, early on that I could do ventriloquism. 
And, uh, you know, so I, I got my little puppet at Sears, $10 for a willy talk. I have him hanging up, uh, not by a noose, but in a, in a shadow box in my dressing room at the Mirage. And, uh, and the rest is history. I just, I never, I fell in love with the art. I actually joined the North American Association of Ventriloquists back when Clinton Detweiler ran it. And I got uh, as many books as I could afford, you know, the little dialogue books and, mm -hmm. um, and all the little things to help me learn how to do it. But I just uh, fell in love with it. I, I decided at, when I was about 11 that I wanted to be a professional ventriloquist for a living. Wow, that's amazing. How did ventriloquism progress through your career? Well, I mean, it helped to have other events to watch. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, uh, if, if it's, I'm assuming mostly ventriloquists are watching this and we all know Willie Tyler and Lester and, um, yes. you know, to see him and Jay Johnson, I think those mm -hmm. are two as, as a, a teenager, those were the two I saw on television all the time in the eighties, way, way before your time. Um, and they would be on game shows and they would be on talk shows. And of course, uh, Jay Johnson was on a, an old uh, sitcom called Soap. And their skills were so unbelievably good. And so just to watch them and study them. And then when I was young, uh, when I was uh, in my maybe 20s, um, Ron Lucas put out his, uh, it must, must have been in the mid 80s, I think. So yeah, I would I'd have been close to 30 when that happened. But uh, Ron Lucas put out a thing on Disney Channel and I had a, a video cassette recorder back when they were new and you know they had just come out. I recorded mm -hmm. that and then Jeff Dunham had done a, uh, a show on Showtime and it was only about a 10 or 15 minute routine, but it had Peanut and Jose Jalapeno. Mm -hmm. And I studied those videos. I, I swear I watched them five times a day for two, three years. And I'm not exaggerating. I mean, I really did. Right. I studied their technique. I studied their, uh, their, how they would change from one puppet to another. I studied uh, character development because my dream was to one day uh, have my own ventriloquism show. And you showed the clip of Texas, the band, um, yes. And I was a singer, so I could sing. I, I didn't even know I was an impressionist, though, until I was in my late, my, no, my mid-30s, probably. And somebody had to point it out to me that I was an impressionist. I just thought anyone who sang would, you know, wanted, if they wanted to, they could sing like the original artist. And somebody, um, I made a comment like that one time, and somebody said, Terry, you're the only person I've ever known that can do that, that can actually sing like <laughs> anybody you want to. Right. And, and it wasn't until a lot later that I decided to mix... Uh, it was in 2015, I uh, no, no, 2005, not 15, 2005 that mm -hmm. I, uh, I decided to make my, my entire show about being a ventriloquist. I went solo as a ventriloquist in 2002, and I, I had a band from 1988 to 2002, so. What was that like with Texas the Band? Oh, it was so much fun. We, um, we were a show band, and the funny thing is, I, I, I noticed uh, that it said, America's number one show band, and, and people would always ask us about that. They'd say, um, oh, how did you get to be in America's number one show band? And, and people didn't realize that we just made that up. We just said, that's what we started <laughs> calling ourselves. And the funny thing is, people believe what you tell them. So if you mm -hmm. say, you know, America's most amazing ventriloquist, and you make that your, your logo, people mm -hmm. are not going to question uh, how, how that came about, you know. Uh, right. Now, I could say I'm the winner of America's Got Talent because I won America's Got Talent. But if you wanted to say, you know, America's number most original ventriloquist, uh, people never question <laughs> where that came mm -hmm. from. So I, I guess the, I guess what you, what I'm trying to say is if you're out there and you're trying to come up with the goods, you know, make sure you come, come up with something that makes you sound really amazing and different than others. And you have to back it up, you know, if you don't. If you're not the, one of the most amazing ventriloquists, I wouldn't say that because people are going to immediately say, "Who the heck said this?" You know, but but if you have some, if you have put some pretty good skills, they're never even going to question it. Wow. So, were you doing the impressions? Were you? Did you even have puppets in your show during Texas the Band? And when did you start doing impressions? Was that when you were in Texas the Band, or was that afterward? No, it was during Texas the Band. I, okay. of course, I, I was I I loved ventriloquism too much to just go straight as a band. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, there's a little story behind that. In uh, I think it was 1991, uh, Warner Brothers came out and saw somebody. Somebody from Warner Brothers had seen us at a bar. Uh, we were a we were a bar band until we went into fairs and festivals, and then started doing fairs, festivals, and corporate parties. Sure. And uh, we were always a big show, and I loved doing ventriloquism. So every maybe 10 to 15 minutes in the show, I would do impressions. Again, I didn't know I was doing impressions, but I would sing George Strait, and then I'd go right into Ozzy Osbourne, and then I'd go into Garth Brooks, and then I'd go right into, uh, you know, Styx. And then, you know, we were doing so, but I didn't realize I was doing the impressions. I just thought that's what you did when you wanted mm -hmm. to sing a song. You sang it like the original artist. It came very naturally for me. And um, 
So this representative from Warner Brothers Records came out and saw us and they loved us. And they said, you guys are really talented, but um, we're going to send somebody out for six months with you. And uh, we're going to help groom you to become a, a signed act, a big, you know, signed band. Oh, and, and, yeah. And so for six months, they were kind of grooming us. They made me take out all the ventriloquism. They made me take out all the comedy. They made me take out all the impressions. And they wanted me to sing everything in my own voice. And I, I've never been more unhappy and miserable. And so about... Maybe, um, oh, it wasn't six weeks in. I told the rest of the guys, I said, guys, I, I would rather be working at Taco Bell than doing this. I don't like this. This is not, this is not fun for me. It's, it's a drudgery. It's a misery to get up and, and get on stage. So I'm going to go out and do ventriloquism and you guys can keep the band. And they all said, eh, we kind of enjoyed the uh, fun because they were entertainers too. Uh, you know, we had a drummer that would balance uh, balance chickens, uh, rubber chickens on his nose while he played the drums. You know, oh. we were all about we were all about having fun and enjoying yeah. ourselves and just being a regular band that just played music and didn't do anything. It just wasn't fun. So uh, so I made that choice that I wanted to do ventriloquism. But my dream was to have my own ventriloquism show, which is why I went solo in 2002, because I finally you know, the guys the guys wanted to go back to bars and they said, you know, we really want to just play music. And I said, this is a perfect time for us to separate because I've always wanted to have a ventriloquist show like Ron Lucas and Jeff Dunham that I'd seen in the eighties. And I said, man, I'm, I'm dying to do this. And so I started putting together my, my show. And then I saw an, an impressionist in Vegas uh, who did singing impressions. Mm -hmm. And it, and it was then that I realized, uh, and I was watching every time he would go into a different singing impression, the, crowd went crazy and i and it was in 2005 when i did that danny gans was his name he's passed away unfortunately since then and um so i i left that theater thinking i'm gonna do that but instead you know there's already a danny gans i don't want people to say oh it's danny gans light so i said i'm a ventriloquist i'm just gonna start having my my puppets do impressions so the next day i had a show in logandale which is the clark county fair and mm -hmm. uh las vegas is in clark county so it's kind of the fair for, for this area. And and I just had one of my puppets sing Friends in Low Places and the audience jaws dropped. And I said, okay, I'm onto something here. So so I knew I knew I'd found I found my niche. Wow. So at that at that time that you started doing these songs and these impressions, did you have characters that fit them or did you later have to acquire those characters? No, I, I did. Um, I, I would create characters. Uh, now, Walter, you see him on the back behind me. Mm. I've got my video playing behind me. Um, that Walter is my very first puppet. I, I got, well, my very first professional puppet. He was my 18th birthday present from my family. And uh, and he, he went through several incarnations until I started playing um, country bars in Texas. We named our band Texas, the band to try to sound country. And we mm. thought there was money in, in country music at country bars. So I, so I went back and I, um, and I was able to, uh, to create this country character and his name was Walter Airedale. And I, I had created that character, I think in 1984, when Walter Mondale was running against Ronald Reagan and I wanted a political character and he had a Minnesotan accent and I named him Walter Airedale so that, so that he could, so that he could be like a, you know, he's like, oh, I'm running for president. My name is Walter Airedale, you know? And so, uh, so then once that was all over and nobody, who knows where, who Walter Mondale is anymore. When right. I decided to play country bars, I just put a T in there and I thought, man, that sounds really country. And I put a little cowboy hat on him, uh, got his little cowboy suit, as you see it behind me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I put a little cowboy suit on him and a, and a cowboy hat and I gave him that country accent, which was easy because I, I grew up in Texas. I used to actually mm -hmm. talk like Walter. I, uh, I went to uh, college and took radio and television and learned how to, uh, how not to have an accent. But then I kept that old accent for Walter T. Airedale there. So, <laughs> Wow. That is, that's absolutely fascinating. I always love hearing the backstories on how characters were created and, and how that, that adjustment came into play. So America's Got Talent, how did that come to be? Did you go to them? Did they find you? What, what's the story behind that? Absolutely. They found me. I, I had some people that kind of mentioned it to me the first year, the first season. Mm -hmm. And my first reaction was, absolutely no way am I going to do a, a, a you know a reality show. It sounded like the Gong Show to me, so I said, absolutely not. This is horrible. And and so anyway, I was playing fairs that year, um, a lot of fairs. I was doing fairs. That was my kind of my bread and butter. And then I was doing schools in the off season. But this was in the summer of uh, two thousand and six. 
And um, every time I would get done with one of the fairs, and and my my crowds were growing because they were fascinated by the by the ventriloquism and impressions. So whereas before I started doing the ventriloquism and impressions, every time I moved, I changed puppets, uh, I would lose my entire crowd. So I'd have twenty people in the audience at a fair. I would I would finish a routine and go to get my next puppet, and everybody would leave, and then I would have to start over. Well. Once I started doing having the puppets do impressions, mm -hmm. nobody left because they wanted to see what impression the next puppet was going to do. So I was doing, you know, 20, 30, 40 impressions in every show of singers sure. and, and people were fascinated. Well, um, afterwards, people started saying, are you watching America's Got Talent? And I and I actually was. I was trying to keep an eye on it because I wanted to see uh, the format and find out if it was a good show. And I was very impressed. It was very respectful to the to the talent. It did not. It was not at all mean-spirited. I thought it was going to be, you know, mean and it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So I was intrigued, but not intrigued enough to do it. But apparently um, thousands of people from all over the country were emailing NBC and telling them they had seen this ventriloquist who did impressions of singers uh, at a fair. And they called me. They actually, I get this phone call and I look at my phone and it says NBC. And I'm like, NBC. So I answer the phone and they're like, you know, we're getting letters, we're getting emails from everybody and letters from people all over the country. Would you be interested in auditioning? And I said, yeah, of course. Yeah, I'd love to. So, uh -huh. so I, uh, they happened to, you know, we looked at my schedule and they said, well, you know, we're doing something in LA. And I said, well, I'm, I'm playing a school in LA. And, uh, and I think I finished at 2.30 or 3 and I, I went straight over to the LA Convention Center and the rest is history. Wow. That's that's amazing. It's it's so neat to hear. We had uh, we had Darren Carr on a few days ago, and I talked to him about Australia's Got Talent because he was on that, and they had they had called him, and it was interesting hearing his story and his interaction with it, and how he wanted to see how uh, being a ventriloquist on there would pan out. Um, we have a question over here. What was your most impactful interaction on or off air uh, during AGT? Um, there was. I, probably, you know, they, there wasn't a whole lot of interaction with uh, with people that were on, mm -hmm. w you know, people behind the scenes. Although occasionally, you know, I'd be stuck in an elevator with, uh, you know, Piers Morgan. And one time I was there with Piers Morgan and David Hasselhoff. And I started, I threw my voice and I was like, let me out of here, someone let me out. You know, and people, and they were so blown away. And I was just doing it just for fun. And they were like, oh my God, we didn't know you could do that, you know? And so, um, so I, I did, uh, so I got to know them, but I think probably the most meaningful was uh, the, the night I won, we went to a little club in, in Hollywood. It was right, that's where they, they did the show at the time. I think they do it in Hollywood again. It moved to New York when Howard Stern was on it, but uh, it, it moved back to Hollywood. And we went to this little club and they were doing a, a, a wrap up party and all three judges were there. And I went and, and I was kind of milling about and, and David Hassall comes up and he taps me on the shoulder and he pulls me aside and he says, Terry, um, I'm just going to give you a bit of advice. You know, uh, I th think your talent's incredible. I think your talent's amazing. But I want you to remember, don't ever forget your fans because without your fans, you wouldn't have this gig. And he said, yes, you just always have to be respectful and, and grateful uh, to your fans. Um, I thought that was really sweet. It's not something I, I think I've, I really needed to hear just because... Mm -hmm. There's no way I would forget my fans because I spent my whole life wishing I had fans, you know, when I was 42. Right. So I never had real fans until then. And and so it was something that I definitely would have done anyway. But I just thought that was a cool, a very cool thing for uh, for David to do. Wow. We have, a, we have a comment here. Randy Gentry said, uh, Terry singing with Kermit had to be pretty cool. Oh, there are no words. I mean, how do you even? And the thing is, is that was a surprise for me. Oh, um, really? I mean, not the, the actual performance, but but mm -hmm. what happened was they told me I had already talked to Simon a couple of times, and and that wasn't unusual because Simon is the executive producer, and he he is personally involved. So he didn't just call me; he called a lot of people. At one point, he called me and told me that he really wanted me to do uh, Tony Bennett. Uh, sing Tony Bennett, and I said, "Great, I'm in. Let's. I'll do it. You bet. You said. Mm -hmm. You said to, and yeah, I'm in. So, um, so, but, um, okay. I, I just lost my train of thought. What was the question again? Or the or the comment? We we're talking about uh, Kermit the Frog. Kermit the Frog. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So they told me. That's why I was mentioning Simon. Is mm -hmm. they said Simon has a question for you. He needs you to. He needs. So you need to be in this room, and and he's going to call. And I said, Oh, yeah. Oh, of course, of course. So I go and I get in the room and I'm sitting there 
and they've got the cameras rolling and I'm thinking, ah, you know, they're going to do some sort of some behind the scenes thing. And so the phone rings, I pick it up and I said, hello. And they said, hello, Terry, this is Kermit the Frog. And I, I, I literally just freaked out because it was Kermit the Frog calling me. He says, I heard you're a big fan of mine and I'd like to uh, perform with you. Is that okay? I said, yeah, I would love to perform with you. So uh, that whole thing was surreal. It was just surreal. I mean, they tore the whole studio apart. They they made the judges into Muppets. Uh, it was beautiful because all the judges that were Muppets were ones who, who don't talk. Animal, Beaker, and then um, who was the other one? Oh, and the Swedish Chef. So uh, uh -huh. So they were the judges. And then there I am with Kermit. And I, I think it was just as thrilling to have the uh, the chicken sing back up with me when they were singing with it. Uh, that it what a what an unbelievable experience that was. Yeah, that was quite quite incredible. Wow. That's super neat. Did you get to meet the puppeteers behind the characters? I did, yes. And and uh, Steve and I, Steve Whitmire, who okay. is no longer who is no longer the uh, Kermit, but at the time, uh, we actually developed a very not a close relationship, but a, but a friendship, and we were very friendly. He came to the show one time um, and saw my my uh, Winston do uh, Kermit the Frog, and he said, "Wow," he said, "I think uh, you were channeling uh, Jim Henson tonight," and so that was wow. that was quite a. And he signed my he signed the actual Kermit that uh, that I had that I was using before. The reason Winston, the impersonated turtle, mm -hmm. didn't even exist. I had a Kermit the Frog puppet and I wanted to use him on America's Got Talent and the Muppets wouldn't allow me to. So they actually said, no, you can't, you can do the voice, but you can't do the puppet. So I, I created Winston. I just found this puppet online and had mm -hmm. him shipped there overnight. <laughs> wow. Wow, well, we have a comment from Steve Axtell. He said, tell us what, about what your voice doctor said about your skill. Hmm. My voice doctor is uh, Dr. Wayne Kirkham. Uh, if you're anywhere near Dallas and you have voice issues, I highly recommend him. Uh, Dr. Wayne Kirkham, uh, K-A-R-K-H-A-M. He's he's the the voice doctor to the stars, and I'm not kidding you. He does. He he did Luciano Pavarotti. He did Frank Sinatra. He did uh, Ronald Reagan. He still does Celine Dion. Uh, you have top vo vocals in the world. And he um, he has said, in fact, he did an interview with Rolling Stone magazine and they asked him what his, his most unusual uh, clients have been. And he mentioned me and he said, what I do is physically impossible. He said, it can't, you know, I, I don't know how I'm able to get the tones uh, that I'm able to get through this much space in my in, in my lips. I, I don't know. But there's something off and weird about my about my physiology that that allows me to do that. Wow. I'm curious, what would you be doing if you didn't win AGT? Uh, ventriloquism, I'd still be doing it. I was, I was working hard. Um, I never had time off. I was, I think, all told, I was traveling all over the country, coast to coast, from Maine to California, and from Washington State to Florida. I was literally putting, you know, a hundred thousand miles a year on, on my car, driving, you know, to shows. Um, and I, I was, I, I, nine months out of the year, I was doing schools. I was doing five days a week at schools, every single, I never had days off five days a week, every school day. And then I would do runs of fairs during the summer. And that would start in May and June and go all the way in through September. And I would be doing, I would do a, a seven day here and a 10 day and an 18 day at this fair. So I was, I think all told every single year for several years before America's Got Talent, <clears throat> I was performing, um, I was doing, I maybe, I was home maybe three to four weeks a year, um, which is why I was married for so long because we didn't have to see each other. My first wife, we never, literally never saw each other. And no. she even said, it was funny when, when I got the Mirage gig, she would tell people right out, she would say, uh, I don't know how I'm going to stand being with him. You know, I, she didn't like me. She really didn't like me. She's like, you know, it's fine. He's on the road all the time. I don't know how I'm going to stand having him home all the time. So that's not a good basis for a good marriage. Now my yeah. wife Angie loves. Now my wife Angie loves having me. We have had so much fun at, during this quarantine, and mm -hmm. but it's we we're hardly ever apart anyway. We've been together now. We we just met each other about five years ago, April twenty sixth, I believe it was. Okay. And we never we we hardly ever spend any time apart. So we're we're not having a problem at all uh, with the quarantine. Yeah. What are you guys doing to keep busy? You talked you talked earlier about, about some games and stuff that you guys. Have been oh. Yeah. Well, I, I work during the day on uh, it, this is kind of my studio. It's actually my home theater. And I got that's my mm -hmm. actually my the, the video playing behind me is my home theater broadcasting it behind me on the screen. But mm -hmm. I will set up a green screen 
And uh, and then I sit here with my puppets and I do my recordings that I'm putting on YouTube and things. Having a lot of fun doing that. And I'm also writing um, scripts for the upcoming shows and and things like that. And um, my wife is is uh, busy, busy, busy working on the business. She runs all of my all of my business things that have to do with my companies and okay. and um, and my career. And then um, you know at five or six o'clock when she's done and she can't make uh, business phone calls anymore, she comes and gets me and we. Uh, we lay in bed and, and play um, and play Animal Crossing. We've been playing Animal Crossing every single day since March 20th, the day it came mm -hmm. out. And oh. I love it. And she loves it. She's never been more addicted to a game. She said she never <laughs> thought she would be. We play it all the time. And yeah. uh, and we watch Hallmark movies and and usually we watch uh, uh, love and romance movies and Hallmark movies while we're while we're playing. Yeah, Hallmark movies are great. They they actually uh, re released a bunch of uh, the the old Christmas movies when the quarantine started. Yeah, so I saw was, that. Uh, yeah, so everyone was I saw that. Um, I'm curious. So Angie ran a catering company before mm -hmm. you met. Is that right? So mm -hmm. how was it? What was the transition like for her going from running this catering company to running Terry Fader? And dealing it was dealing it was it was difficult for her because it was her baby. She uh, she had done that for I think thirty years. She had had this uh, catering company. It was one of the most successful catering companies in Dallas. That's how I mm -hmm. met her. I actually hired her to do a uh, thing for me. And and you know a lot of people when you look at I don't judge people anymore, especially celebrities, because my mm -hmm. life looks like a uh, a tabloid. You know, here I had this wife for 20 years. Again, the only reason that we're, we were married that long is because we never saw each other, never saw each other. Mm -hmm. You know, we were together three to four weeks and and we weren't happy the three to four weeks we were together. Right. So so then it's like, oh, you married a young chick. And it's like, well, the only reason that happened was because I, uh, I wanted children and I wanted to have a family. And it had been kind of a dream. And my first wife did not want kids. So what did I do? I married a young lady who said she wanted to have kids and said that she was in love with me. And I thought I loved her too. And then immediately, as soon as, the um, as soon as we got married she said i don't want kids i decided not to and i'm like oh my gosh here i am i just got myself into this mess yeah. and luckily you know three to four years in she's like you know i don't like being married to an old guy anymore and i'm like good let's you go your way go marry a young guy and i'll i'll just and i swore off women i said i'm no uh -huh. more women for me i'm done i can't have another marriage i'm over it's over and uh, god brought angie into my life about six weeks after making that oath and i i played a, a, an event my sister um hired her knew her through a mutual friend and hired her to cater the mm -hmm. event. And it was a charity event I was doing in Corsicana, Texas. And uh, we met and we've pretty much been inseparable, inseparable ever since. She's my soulmate, no doubt about it. So thank you, God. That's so great to hear. And I've met Angie and she's just one of the sweetest people you'll ever meet. And she's so kind and, and such, a, such a smart, smart woman. Um, I, I'm curious, in your show today, how would you define your style of comedy? You know, I have I, I'm really into situational comedy. Okay. I, I want the the humor to come out of the character and not I'm not now now this is not a criticism, mm -hmm. but most it's it, it's an observation, not a criticism. Most ventriloquists are I have a puppet, the uh, the puppet I, I, I say a, a straight line, the puppet tells a joke. I say a straight line, the puppet tells a joke. I prefer to create characters that the humor can come out of their character. And and it was interesting because I have writers that work with me. I, I pretty much do most of the work in writing, but I, I do have a, a writer that's full-time staff. I have two writers actually that are full-time staffed with me. And it, it took him, he's one of the writers, for, he, he's one of the top comedy writers in the business. He writes the Academy Awards. He writes the, uh, the, um, the Emmys. He writes, uh, you know, all, I mean, he writes for some of the top comedians on the planet and he's a, my full-time writer. And he told me it took two to three years to understand the fact that my uh, that my show is very much based on character. And so he would write a line or write a joke or a funny idea, and I would have to tell him, "No, Winston would never say that. That's that sounds more like Dougie, or, or you know, Walter would never say that. That sounds more like Vicky." And he started to understand it. He's like, "Oh my gosh, you're right. You're right." And so now we don't even have that issue because he immediately knows when he writes an, an idea or a funny. So, um, so that's really what, and, and if people are out there and they're, they're not understanding what I'm referring to, the best way to find out what I'm talking about is watch everybody loves Raymond or Seinfeld. And if you do, there are almost no jokes in those shows at all. You can go an entire episode and not hear one joke. It's all about the humor, the situation, the humor comes from the characters 
And and that so it's much harder to write that. And I also don't write dirty humor. I write I tap dance on the line, but I will not write blatantly dirty. I will not swear. It is always 100 percent time uh, of the time going to be funny when a mm -hmm. puppet swears. Always. People are going to laugh. But right. it, but I just look at it. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. If that's how you, you do it, I, I'm fine with that. That's totally fine. Um, I just feel like I want to try to do it so that you don't have to feel like you need to go wash your kids ears out after after my show, you know. And kids sure. are automatically uh, attracted to puppets, so mm -hmm. I know they're going to be children at the show. Now, I will definitely tell adult jokes that are, you know, hidden in in hidden double meanings, and I'm fine. With, I don't have a problem with that at all. Um, I had a line one time, and um, my and I, I still do it in my show. In fact, it's where Vicky, uh, we show her a picture of her on the red carpet, and she's got this slit that goes way up, you know, her leg. Mm -hmm. And she goes, I said, man, that that's quite a slit. And she says, yeah, I know you can almost see the red carpet. And um, and so it's a funny joke. And I had a guy come up to me afterwards, and he goes, my six year old daughter wants to know what that joke means. And I looked at her, and I and I said, I said, uh, well, you know, in Hollywood, when they do uh, the any award show. They have a red carpet and the ladies have to walk up the red carpet in order, and and the guy looks at me and goes nice and so that's really how i like to do i like to do it so that if your kid is too young to understand it that there's going to be a clean there's going to be a clean explanation for them and then mm -hmm. and then for those of us who get it it's a, it's just a double kind of a double laugh for us so well that's, that's just my that's just yeah, that's just my my opinion. I mean, my my taste. It's not. I'm not criticizing the way other people do their shows. I mean, I I love. Uh, I was just watching a uh, Dave Straussman, and he swears in his mm -hmm. show, and it's unbelievable. He is truly one of the great, most gifted and incredible yeah, ventriloquists. Like his show is like a production. <laughs> oh, it's it's un, He's unbelievable. Yeah. He's unbelievable. And and so there are so many incredible ventriloquists and I'm certainly not not dissing anyone. I'm just giving you my my opinion and my the way I do. You asked me how 